Good afternoon. Welcome to all our viewers. Welcome to all those at home on the moon. Welcome to all our participants. Well, here we are. This is the final round of the Kwame Memorial Lecture Series. We are very excited about today's discussions. So just to remind you that we've had uh, four good sessions here um, during this Kwame Memorial uh, Lecture Series. We've been exploring some more information about Kwame, and it's very important. And we had um, a wonderful conversation at the outset with Dr. Joseph. Um, and uh, we moved from talking about himself to looking at issues such as the Haitian crisis and what was the responsibility. Um, then we talked about a youth in crisis. And here we are now looking at um, women in the Pan-African struggle. I think it's a fitting way to bring the Kwame Ture Memorial series to a close. Um, we really have a wonderful uh, group of women, uh, three of them who will join us this afternoon. Uh, we will begin with um, really um, an outstanding sister. We, we can give her nothing but praises because of course she um, flags, she, she flies that flag of Tobago and the Caribbean very, very high in very high places. And so we are always, you know, very have her and that is uh dr carol boyce davies dr davies and i tell you a little about her before we bring her on inviting her to lead off the discussion this afternoon she's the rhodes professor of humane letters which is an endowed professor named after the ninth president of cornell university and she's professor of africanities and literature in english at cornell university she's the author of course of the prize left of Karl Marx, the political life of black communist Claudia Jones. The classic black women writing an identity, migrations of the subject published before. Caribbean spaces, escape routes from twilight zones in 2020, 2020 on the internationalization of Caribbean culture. And a bilingual children's story, which I was not aware of, um, walking an avant, which is in Haitian Creole and English. I'm going to find that one, Carol, and, and have a good look at it myself. Um, Haiti's dear to my heart. In addition, she's written hundreds of essays and articles published in major professional journals. Um, she's also published 15 critical editions on African, African diaspora and Caribbean literature and culture, such as the collection of critical and creative writing, moving beyond boundaries, international dimensions, women's writing volume one, and Black Women's Diasporas, volume two. The third volume, Encyclopedia of the African Diaspora in 2008, and Claudia Jones, Beyond Entertainment, Autobiographical Reflections, Poetry and Essays, and Pan-African in 2019. She's a member of the Scientific Committee for UNESCO's updated General History of Africa. She edited the Epistemological Forum on Global Blackness for the African Diaspora volume and is a member of the Scientific Committee of the African Humanities Forum based in Mali. Her most recent publication is Black Women's Rights, Leadership, and the Circularities of Power, 2022. And it will be out in paperback in September 2023. So of course, Carol has given a look forward to. She's a past president of the Caribbean Studies Association, which organized under the first CSA which conference which was held in Haiti in 2016. Popular essays and reviews have appeared in The Guardian, London, The Washington Post, The Crisis, Miss Martin, Ithaca Journal, The Black Scholar, Miami Herald, Trinidad Express, Trinidad Guardian, Caribbean Today, In Contact, and Newsweek. And I'm going to tell you a little secret about Dr. Carol Boyce Davies, which I only when she was in Trinidad a few months ago, which is that she actually attended Eastern Girl Primary School right there off Duke Street in Port of Spain. And, you know, behind the bridge, as we call it. And it just, it just connects us and, what shall I say, signals to us over and over again that our can rise uh, to any dimensions if we only give them the opportunity um, that are so uh, essential to, to allowing us to... to 
uh, Dr. Carol Boyce Davies, really, we thank you for honoring this, this discussion this afternoon. I give the floor, of course, to this wonderful sister, Dr. Carol Boyce Davies. Hi, thank you, Asha, for that um, lovely introduction. And just so you know, when I went to Eastern Girls, it used to be on George Street. It was actually one of the best schools for primary education at that time with amazing teachers. But I joked the last time I was in Trinidad saying that I had a, a strange situation because I grew up with a mother who didn't really spank me at all. And then when I went there, they were beating like crazy. So I had pulled back a lot from <laughs> the kinds of advancements I should have had while I was there, but I did well. So I, as you can tell, I did well in the end anyway. But um, just just letting you know where it was. It was right next to the market and jokingly people used to call it market school, but that tells you how old I am, right? Okay. Anyway, thank you for your great introduction. And I'm, you know, I'm sorry I'm not there directly in person. Uh, I want to thank you for the invitation and the Emancipation Support Committee, as you know, throughout the years, every time I have a chance, I've always tried to attend the events whenever I'm in Trinidad or come down deliberately for, I usually come down deliberately for the parade and bring friends and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a joy being here, although we're doing this from a distance, but now we have the technology, right? So we can be in many locations. Thank you to your support staff too, for their work behind the scenes and for your continuance. And I say this because many organizations, and you know Kwame Ture was always like, organize, 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 right? And um, um, it was quite interesting. I have to tell you a little anecdote about Kwame Ture, people, if you're listening. When I was at Binghamton, he would come and go to Cornell, where I work now, but I used to teach at Binghamton University, SUNY, and he would often, when he was invited by James Turner, he would come to Cornell, and then he would come to Binghamton and do you know, his usually great spirited lecture and all of that. And then, so one day he came and then there was a reception for him afterwards. So I went to the reception, you know, as a new prof, young prof and so on, very timidly, I said, I'm from Trinidad. And he said, that country that didn't let me in. And then I was so embarrassed, I kind of pulled back to the back. Anyway, he came back another time and he told the students, there's a sister from Trinidad here, tell her to come back here and sit with me. And he was sitting in a room by himself, um, waiting to give his talk. And he wanted me just to sit with him while he did that. And I'm so honored. He, I guess he was trying to make up for his hasty words um, at that time. And he knew, I suppose, that it was a little bit kind of hurtful when he said that. But it was true. So he, I mean, he was right to see what he did. But just letting you know that story about him. But um, as a grad student at Howard, he would always come to Howard campus I, when I was a grad student there. And he was so dashing and all the women were like dying to be with him and all that. <laughs> but he was like always very clear politically. So I'm glad. But anyway, thank you for that invitation. So I want to talk today and it, it sort of follows from my book, um, recent book, Black Women's Rights, Leadership and the Circularities of Power, but very specific to the theme that I was asked to talk about, which is women in the Pan-African struggle. So I will begin now. So I have some slides that go with this um, presentation that gives you a little bit more detail so that you can see some of the things I'm saying. And when I call them out, they will appear on the screen from the um, person who is coordinating that in Trinidad, which is really another cool thing, isn't it? Anyway. So the absence of the knowledge of women in the leadership of political organizations and movements provides a correlation with the limited accession to political power. I'm saying the absence of that knowledge has a direct impact on how we ourselves, who are in the surrounding or receiving communities, I should say, engage uh, or know that we can also be leaders. According to Power and Decision Making of the World's Women 2015, the role of women in political movements and organizations provides another context for understanding the nature of women's leadership. The role of women in mainstream political parties consistently has advanced from constructed absence, which is an amazing thing because at the turn of the century, that is 2000, there was only 6% of women in leadership positions in the world, 6%. So it's moved from constructed absence to more visibility following the charges and the claims of the second wave feminist movement of the 1980s, 70s, and 80s. 
this is the process we are engaged in today as we reflect on women in Pan-African struggle. So recognizing then that uh, the work on revealing the full extent of the participation of women in Pan-Africanism is taking place now, meaning that scholars are doing the work, historians are digging up the archival work to find out who those women are, uh, with a new work, for example, that came out just recently called Mary McLeod, the Pan-Africanist, which is amazing because I have always heard about Mary McLeod Bethune, the founder of Bethune Cookman College and the National Council of, 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 of Women, uh, National Association of Colored Women, and NACW, but I never knew of her as a Pan-Africanist. So that to me is a whole additional bit of information that I got just from a work which came out this year. So recognizing then that the work is taking place now, what I offer today has to be seen also as part of the circulating discussion, the available research and positions mindful that we are always working towards fuller realization of the extent of the knowledge of our communities. In other words, black people just trying to reconstruct themselves are reconstructing their families still, you know, finding who we are via ancestry.com, via research in libraries, archival work, you know, online things that Skip Gates does, like finding your roots and all of that. But this means then that often the grassroots work of women, numerous women in organizations before us often went unaccounted for as the more messianic representation got depressed. More messianic meaning the people who stand up like the Jesus figure and being and is the one who has to lead you to the promised land, as it were, like the Martin Luther Kings and so on. Not disparaging them, but just saying that that's the model that has been used before. But still, according to 2021 figures, while women are underrepresented still at all levels of decision-making worldwide and achieving gender parity in political life is far off, women demonstrate political leadership by working across party lines through parliamentary women's caucuses, even in the most politically combative environments and by championing issues of gender equity, such as the elimination of gender-based violence, parental leave, childcare, pensions, gender, equality and electoral reforms and so on. And this is according to 2021 figures from the world's women. So assessing these developments then against an international benchmark reveals the difficulties as well as the gains to date. In other words, basically what we see then is that we find a number of ways in which a variety of different types of forms offer strategic context for activists to be able to do that work. And a good example, for example, is Maureen Shepard working in that um, con connection in the UN, but knowing that she does a lot of work on reparative justice as well, and a lot of work on women in Jamaica and women in the Caribbean and so on. So for the purposes of my work, uh, which is interesting, and all of our work looking at women, there are a couple of international conventions which we have to point out. First of all, CEDAW, the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, has a series of sections that talk about the rights of women. So in other words, when people talk about women's rights, what they want to know where to find out what those rights are, what are those rights? It's the same human rights that everybody wants, the rights to the rights to vote, to education, to participate in the decisions of their countries, uh, you know, to elect officials that they choose, to have their issues represented, and so on. But keep in mind that what I've found out in my own work is that that right to vote like the abolition of slavery in the 19th century, it took the entire 20th century to be realized, beginning with the suffragist movements in the United Kingdom and the United States, which organized to challenge this blatant inequity. In other words, the right, you know, the right to vote, the whole full range of suffragist um, operations uh, or the rights to really be participant fully in one's culture for women took the entire 20th century. In the same way, the abolition of slavery, and although we celebrate emancipation, we know that that also took an entire century, the entire 19th century to be realized from 1804, beginning with the Haitian Revolution, all the way to what happens in, in Trinidad, in the, in the Caribbean in the 1830s. Although we know though that we had emancipation so-called, but then we also had apprenticeship so-called. Uh, and then you have, you know, Martinique and the Caribbean countries, Latin America, all the way up to 1888, uh, essentially. It took the entire century for emancipation. In the same way, the rights of women to full participation similarly took an entire century. Isn't that amazing? So my point here is that the right to vote is seen then as the most fundamental of democratic citizenship rights, but it also portends the participation of women in the policy arena 
In other words, it's not just the right to vote. CEDA also suggests, though, that women have a right to be represented fully in their political operations of their countries. We still haven't got to that, is the point that we are making and that my work argues. Uh, you know, in other words, if you look at the United States, it's still something like 24% of representatives women. In the Senate, there's no black woman, for example, although you do have um, a vice president in Kamala Harris, but she was a senator when she became vice president. There's no black woman in the Senate at all. So talk about democracy as it relates to some of these countries that claim it is really interesting. So in the current United States, for example, it's about 23%, 23.7% uh, of women, 26% in the Senate and so on. Anyway. In other words, it hovers for the world around 24%. This leads us then to assess women as leaders in selected political movements and organizations, particularly the Pan-African movement of which the, uh, we are talking about today, women in the Pan-African struggle. So if I can have slide one, then we can look at what some of that means. According to Tony Martin, our dear colleague who we lost some time ago, six ideas have dominated Pan-Africanism, right? a global African community, Africa's base, return ideological emotive, a politically unified continent, a race-based global movement with a continental United States of Africa, which was the Nkrumah's vision, economies that bring together Africa and the African diaspora, if possible, outside of European globalization, and for him, Pan-African impact on world affairs. And actually, this Tony Martin definition is available in Encyclopedia of the African Diaspora, which I edited, which um, Asha Campbell just indicated, right? So if we can get to slide two then, number two, Pan-Africanism, we know, just providing background that we already know, you in the audience may know, but just for context, right? Began as a formal ideological principle under the leadership of Henry Sylvester Williams, a Caribbean lawyer, who organized the first conference in 1900 in Westminster Hall, London. Early, and this is the important point I wanna make next then, early coverage of the 1900 Pan-African Conference describes delegates who represented the United States, Canada, Ethiopia, Haiti, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and the then Gold Coast, most of the islands of the then British West Indies. But next, look at this. Importantly, in the powerful US delegation were W.E.B. Du Bois, Miss Anna Jones, Kansas, and Miss Annie Cooper, who uh, is otherwise known as Anna Julia Cooper from Washington, D.C. So the point is that from the beginning of Pan-Africanism as a formal movement, as identified by Sylvester Williams in 1900, in that first meeting in London, there were women present. Uh, it's a Pan-Africanism then, we know, served as ideological anchor throughout the 21st century and into the 20th century and into the 21st, following Du Bois's famous assertion that the 20th century is the century of the color line. In other words, a century in which race would dominate. So slide three, please. So note that even before 1900, remember the conference was 1900, right? So even before 1900, Anna Julia Cooper, though, had written a book, one of the first books to put together theoretically race and gender. It was titled A Voice from the South, and it was published in 1892. Again, 1892, the conference was 1900. An activist for Black and women's rights, my assumption is that she was invited on the basis of this book in which she says the following, only the Black woman can say when and where I enter in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood without violence and without suing or special patch patronage, then and there, the whole Negro race enters with me. That's from Anna Julia Cooper, A Voice from the South, 1892, eight years before that first Pan-African conference. Uh, and we're suggesting she was a, an attendee at the conference. She was a delegate. Uh, and I, I believe there are people who work specifically on her. There's a new book which recently came out about her, which has provided additional details about her life and her participation in that conference. So slides five and six, if you don't mind. While we tend to describe some of these movements as monolithic, though, we can identify a variety of strands in Pan-Africanism, some of which include the early Pan-Africanism and movements of return by Blyden, Kiesley, Hayford, Love, etc. A Pad Moore, uh, who is also from Trinidad, 
otherwise known as Malcolm Nurse, who brings together Pan-Africanism and socialism, but usually it's seen as him providing an option after he leaves the communist movement, so, uh, creating an option which is titled Pan-Africanism or socialism. And definitely there are different varieties of Pan-Africanism. Clearly there's a Caribbean Pan-Africanism, there's an African-American version with Du Bois and others, uh, and Kumaism and the idea of a united Africa which runs you know, through the continent, and definitely the bureaucratic OAU current, AU African Union Pan-Africanism. Uh, and also we have to then identify a category of Pan-African feminists or feminist Pan-Africanists as a major category. So basically what happened was that the subsequent historical accounting uh, keep, in keeping with the politics at that time solidified the movement as a male-led movement. Note number three in particular that follows, right? Slide seven, that they wanted asked for integrity of the three existing black states to be recognized, Haiti, Liberia, Ethiopia, and asked Europeans not to degrade themselves by degrading colonial peoples, race uplift as a pro uh, progressive doctrine. My students are always baffled by that number two. And uh, number three, that all black men everywhere were exhorted to provide their right to be counted among the great brotherhood of mankind, right? So that's number three. Note number three, right, how it's framed. But keep in mind, that's the language and that's the way that people identified humankind back then using the language of, of masculinity. All black men everywhere exhorted to prove their right to be counted. And of course, an organizational structure and uh, a biennial conference and so on was the other point. It is important to assert though that women have consistently played a role in political movements even when their leadership has not been perceived. Organizing sites for struggle include, slides eight and nine, please, slide eight, probably first, conferences and congresses, grassroots political movement, left organizations, black women's organizations, churches, political organizations, literature, music, cultural and spiritual practices. All of this then throughout that whole century resulted in a century of activity with Du Bois' statement, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line being identified. So we know then that Pan-Africanism was an ideological movement, slide nine, which served as an anchor for black political movement for much of the 20th century, that it led to a series of decolonization movements worldwide, resulting in current independence movements and countries for them that, that actually received them and culminating in the first independent African nation, Ghana, under Kwame Nkrumah, where I just returned from attending uh, the funeral of the writer, Matt Taidu. And of course, those of you who've been to Ghana will see that imprint all over, you know, the black stars everywhere and the dedications to Nkrumah. There's a new Nkrumah memorial um, redone um, that opened in July. Um, the formation of the OAU, Organization for African Unity, now the African Union. But what about the simultaneity of oppressions, which is in my title, my subtitle? While intersectionality has become popular, though, as we know in current discourses, intersectionality all over the media, everywhere, um, sometimes criticized by the American right wing, advised by Kimberly Crenshaw, the idea, of course, is not so much an intersection, uh, which is a very graphic description of the placement or erasure of black women in the courses of several positions, but that simultaneously of oppressions was an earlier framework used by black feminists in the United States, taken from Harriet Tubman um, actions in the Kambahi River, in which Africa, uh, black feminists and African feminists have continued to use. In other words, I'm making the point that while intersectionality is much more currently used and students love it and many people use it and the media uses it for all kinds of things now, the framework that women used uh, in black feminist movement was the simultaneity of oppressions. So if we can go to slide 10, we can see what I'm talking about. So this provides then the and instead of the choice suggested linguistically by an or which was the dominant approach to ideological positions before this. In other words, many people in before the black feminist association of this way of thinking 
preferred, you know, would often get positioned that you had to choose a side. You had to either be a communist or, or a black conscious nationalist, a black nationalist. You had to choose. Uh, you couldn't be one or the other. But for black feminists, there was a putting together automatically then in their framework of that and so that you can have an identity politically identified that was both black consciously oriented, but also woman consciously oriented. So it, that and then is part of what we want to talk about in terms of that simultaneously of oppressions. So for me, that's another missing framework that we don't hear about much, right? Uh, voiced uh, earlier by people like Maria Stewart, who uh, in many ways would be a forerunner of some of this thinking. So Maria Stewart in the United States developed that framework called Daughters of Africa, which is fascinating in itself. And this is a model subsequently used as title by people like Margaret Busby. Now, if any of you have seen that collection, you would know what I'm talking about. And if I can get slide 11, probably it will show it. Um, so slide 11 would give you that detail. So Daughters of Africa is the framework that would be used um, by uh, people like Margaret Busby for her book, right? Um, so you could see it. But essentially, Mara Stewart would also be somebody who noticed Du Bois would talk about the problem of the 20th century being the problem of the color line, um, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa is a full quote in his The Souls of Black Folk. Maria Stewart in 1803 to who has lived from 1803 to 1879, used the language of the Daughters of Africa framework in her first public lecture about women's rights. And this is where she says, O ye daughters of Africa, arise, awake. What have you done to immortalize your names beyond the grave? Notice she's using Daughters of Africa, which is clearly a Pan-Africanist framework, isn't it? So Murray Stott would also talk about the whole idea that the men who are the sons of Africa, notice in the second part of that quote on the screen, um, she's challenging the men to do something. She also noticed maintain the use of the language of African in her speech. She's talking to the men where she says African rights and liberty is a subject that ought to fire the breasts of every man and of color in these United States and so on. And she's really challenging them to really step up and do something. And she actually says in some cases that if they don't, women are going to have to do it. Where's the man who has distinguished himself in these modern days by acting wholly in the defense of African rights and liberty? She insisted then that women will also stand up and struggle. And in a way, many ways, this connects to Sojourner Truth, uh, entire woman subsequently. Not so? Maria Stewart. So clearly then we have in the earlier languaging of those women who were able finally to assert themselves. Notice she's speaking in 1833 in a time when the U.S. still had slavery. 1865 is when their slavery would end. Um, and you would see clearly that she's pushing forward with an assertion first of Africa as an identity. But it, people have done who have done the research have indicated that that logic of using Africa stayed consistently up until the later years when it was, you know, later people removed and started calling themselves other things. Uh, besides that, this is where we get the AME church. Those of you who know about that history would understand what I'm talking about. So, and also the additional um, work done by the National Association of Colored Women that I mentioned earlier, slide 14, as early as 1819, six saw themselves as global citizens of Africa living in the United States and they organized with issues like against the colonization of Africa and the occupation of Haiti. Note the Berlin Conference in 1885. Notice they are saying this in 1896. The Berlin Conference in 1885 was where Africa was divided under colonial powers and as we know ushered in the issues that still plague Africa today. All right, so that's like 14. So a subsequent organization, you would notice, was the International Council of Women of the Darker Races, 1922, in which Mary McLeod Bethune was prominent. And I mentioned the new work which talks about her. That's slides 15 and 16, right? So Mary McLeod Bethune, um, who I found really fascinating, and the slide has moved around a little bit since it traveled to Trinidad. But the first meeting, notice the first meeting had women from Africa, Haiti, 
India, Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka. They actually formed a committee to create a curriculum for studying black literature and history, just as Carter G. Woodson would do subsequently in 1926. Notice they were doing this in 1922. So again, this is what we mean about the work of women taking place, um, you know, sometimes without the full recognition they're doing this the issues and working behind the scenes and then the guy does it and suddenly his is the one that really gets taken up but mary mcleod bethune interestingly and this is what really blew my mind and if you get a chance try to get a hold of this book uh you can order it i suppose on one on online sources but it's called mary mcleod bethune the pan-africanist and when i saw the title and i knew i was going to give this talk i said i have to get this book and read it and it totally blew my mind because i had no idea because she's presented often in terms of a very narrow u.s centric kind of framework but this was a woman who was really clear about her identity she says for i am my mother's daughter and the drums of africa still beat in my heart this is one of her famous lines um and often although she's known for this u.s linear history she really spent a lot of time broadening this whole question of african diaspora identity trying to find ways to make connections across cuba haiti india and africa and all of this would shape her global vision um so that really um really fascinated me that this was a person and again I love the fact of getting new knowledge, and clearly this is one example of that. But let us look at the Caribbean then. If we look specifically at the Caribbean, slide 17, we note, for example, that during and after emancipation, 1834 to 1865, generations of Black women reenacted and sustained their own community, empowering leadership with, of course, the founding legacy of Nani, Queen of the Maroons, um, of Jamaica's national hero, but additionally with everyday acts of resistance and organized resistance, forming their own African Christian churches, revival is in Zion, Maya, and Pocomania. And sometimes they led with leaders of revolts and uh, such as the Moran Bay Re Rebellion. In Brazil, if we want to look at Brazil, you have the Umandaji de Boamochi and Cachoeira, northeastern Brazil, in the 1800s, creating an organization founded by enslaved Africans in Salvador Bahia, in which their framework was it is better to have a good death than to live in slavery. And for me, it recalls Harriet Tubman's famous quote. I had reasoned that this out in my mind. It was one of two things I had a right to liberty or death. If I could not have one, I could have the other. What I love, though, Asha, you would love this. You have to be over 50 to be a member. And I like that point of why, because I'm over 50. <laughs> I'm being totally selfish here. But the point about that is they felt that women who have moved beyond childbearing and all the demands of men and so on, um, definitely then could you know, find a way to be childbearing, child rearing, and all that could be more politically active. So all the senior women out in the audience, this is the time to be active because over 50, you don't have to deal with a lot of dramas, hopefully not, maybe we're getting older with health issues, but we could do a lot more. So the point about Umandaji de Boamorchi is that you have to be 50 to join and over. So when you meet them, and I was so pleased to go to Kashmir and meet those women, they embrace you so happily, but they're all older women and they do a lot of activist work and all kinds of work behind the scenes that you don't realize, right? So that's if we go back to the theme of our presentation and look specifically at one of the major organized black political movements, we get instructive examples from the UNIA, ACL, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, founded by Marcus Gavi and his wife, Amy Ashwood Gavi. Uh, an international political organization. Generally recognized as being led by Marcus Garvey, but the research so far uh, um, by, Keisha, by Tony Martin, clearly 2007, Keisha Blaine, 2018, Natanya Duncan, ongoing work, demonstrate that women's leadership also took the movement forward with reassertions that Amy Ashwood Gavi, Marcus Gavi's first wife, was co-founder and co-builder of the UNIA, and that she was recruited by him for this purpose. Slides 19, please. Um, and this has already been asserted by Pan-African political theorist Cyril Lionel Robert James, our dear CLR, 
who in the history of Pan-African Revolt, 1938, confirmed this collaboration. This is 1938 now that, that this is written. In August 1914, Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican Negro printer, and Amy Ashwood, his friend, almost a schoolgirl, founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association in Kingston, Jamaica, page 197. Hubert Harrison from St. Croix similarly would talk about Amy Ashwood Garvey as being the guiding spirit of the movement. Besides her early work advancing the Black Horse Nurses in the New York establishment of the UNIA, Amy Ashwood Garvey would later develop a proposal for a major project for studying the Black woman in historical context. And I spent a bit of time looking at uh, this in my work um, because Amy Ashwood would actually go to Ghana. Uh, Tony Martin does really great research on this. If you look at his book, which I was really pleased to be part of its launching. And I was one of the speakers when his book was launched in Trinidad a few years ago. But you have photographs of Amy Ashwood going to Ghana and finding her family there and finding her, um, her village where, she, where her grandmother came from and being able to make those connections. And those are the images you should have uh, on screen now. This is Amy Ashwood traveling, who has traveled to West African countries. And here, this is taken from Tony Martin's book, two, two, pages 216 to 20, where she is meeting the Ghanaian family. I remember after she does this, she spends the rest of her time, she would wear kente. So for me, she kind of lived the praxis of Pan-Africanism and feminism. I noticed in this photograph next to Robeson and next to Claudia Jones and next to the wife of Paul Robeson, Eslanda Good Robeson, she is wearing kente and she would also do that. Why is this significant? Because kente has come to symbolize a sort of wealth, creative wealth of Africa is an aesthetic choice. It's still accented in clothing. The, 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 the frameworks of it give us the idea of patchwork that people still use in all kinds of ways as they create patterns of, fa of fabric and quilts and all kinds of things. But more interestingly, Tony Martin describes Amy's circle in this pan praxis of Pan-Africanism and feminism. Keep in mind that Amy Ashwood called herself a feminist. She's one of the few of that generation who actually came specifically out and would use that term to define herself. But according to Tony Martin's book, her circle constituted a variable who's who of pre-independence African and Caribbean politics. Marxist theoretician C.L.R. James child, and his childhood friend, George Padmore, who would also one day become an advisor to Nkrumah in Ghana, Jumo Kenyatta, J.B. Danko, you know, all that whole group. So all of these circled around Amy Ashwood, particularly because she had a cafe and a restaurant where people would come to uh, spend uh, you know, co have, you know, commune and have lunch and eat and chat and plan and all of these kinds of things. But I was also interested in the fact that they said she doesn't get a lot of credit for this, but it seems Du Bois was late and she actually called to order that 1945 Pan-African Conference, which is fascinating, isn't it? So that 1945 Pan-African Conference, if we can go back to the other slide, please, she is actually the one to call it uh, into, into order. Um, a good piece on this is done by Professor Rhoda Radock, and it's called The First Mrs. Garvey, Pan-Africanism and Feminism in the Early 20th Century, British Colonial Caribbean, published in a journal called Feminist Africa. And this journal, Feminist Africa, published in 2006, has quite a bit of uh, other, quite a number of other essays on, on this question of Pan-Africanism and feminism, which I've used in my own teaching uh, and so on. We can go to the next slide. So Amy Ashwood then, for me, praxis of Pan-Africanism. But we also have the second wife of Marcus Garvey, Amy Jakes Garvey, um, who would be the one to actually document a lot of his work. Um, she would, um, she edited, of course, his var the various philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. She wrote Garvey and Garveyism. She moved to Harlem in 1917 and later married Marcus Garvey. She led the UNIA in Garvey's absence. Uh, another book that really gives you that detail is Eula Taylor's The Veil Garvey, The Life and Times of Amy Jakes Garvey, Community Feminism, is one of the contributions she, uh, uh, Eula Taylor uses to describe what she does. Um, and she submitted two resolutions to that same Pan-African conference in Manchester. I was able, you know, you should, if you get a chance and you're in London at any time, I actually went there and I saw the hallway that 
conference in Manchester was held. And there's still a, one of those plaques on the wall that describe it. Um, but I found it fascinating, too, that she actually wrote to W.E. Du Bois and told him to stop using the word Negro. Um, and you remember Richard Moore from Barbados had a really nice um, long essay that he wrote on the word Negro, its origin and evil use. But she wrote du, uh, du Bois and told him to not use it because I was told Du Bois was going to call it sort of pan-Negroism and people pushed back on that. Um, she also preferred using Caribbeans over the word West Indian because of the Colombian misnomer. And now, of course, that is more in use than, than uh, West Indian. I was told by Gordon Rulia when I was visiting UWE at one point that the only two organizations, two, y'all should be embarrassed by this, but the only two organizations that use, or three, he said, that use West Indian, he said it's the university and the cricket team. Um, so fascinating that the misnomer still stays. So that's Amy Jakes Garvey. And I had a really, a lot of fun doing the review of Tony Martin's book and talking about how she ended up being the second wife and so on. But that's not important here. What is important is the way in which she was able to take back um, the leadership of the movement. She has a really nice piece as well called Women as Leaders, Nationally and Racially, published in 1925, um, in which she actually comes out and says that women of all clans and races uh, have a great part to play in the development of the particular group as men. She says, be not discouraged women of the world, but push forward regardless of the lack of appreciation you are showing. And we need to hear this all the time. Be not discouraged women of the world, push forward regardless of the lack of appreciation shown you. And that Africa must be for Africans and Negroes everywhere must be independent. Ethiopia's queen shall rise again and her Amazons protect her shores. Um, so according to, um, Honor Ford Smith, we can go to the next one, please, if you don't mind. I saw you moving it. Uh, Honor Ford Smith, Women and the Gabby Movement, that women's participation emphasized from was emphasized from the start in the in the UNIA and the Gabby Movement, therefore, by Marcus Gabby choosing to have Amy Ashwood Gabby as his co-founder. Uh, in fact, this the story that is included in Tony Martin's book is amazing. She had been in a debate and he chased her, she was like 17. He chased her down the road where she was waiting for a trolley to go home a tram and asked her, you know, to, you know, they could meet again and so on to have a movement. So he, he recruited her from the start and together they built the movement. But Amy, uh, Anna Ford Smith says that all of the activist movement that subsequently had women in leadership were people who were nurtured within the Gavi movement. Almost every important activist had links with the UNIA. So Gabby, on the one hand, had a more romanticized view of Black women as queens, but in practice, the woman's leadership was more practical. Example, Amy Ashwood Gabby developed the ladies' division and Black Horse Nurses was the editor of the UNIA journal. Right? So this is a, some fascinating information about that period. So a recognition then of the leadership role of women in the UNIA takes nothing away from the historical significance of Marcus Garvey. Indeed, as we saw with um, with the slide 26, which I just showed, the, um, it had a great impact in training women for leadership and having them organized politically and so on. And I think I would love for people to, um, if you have a chance, get a, a copy of that older collection by Veronica Gregg. I think it should be more in circulation because in other words, the dominance of women creative writing um, kind of took over other kinds of contributions, intellectual and otherwise. But that Veronica Gregg book actually combines a number of those essays into an anthology, which then gives us quite a bit of information about Caribbean women and the kinds of positions they took between 1890 notice and 1980, right? In that, there's an essay very early, which is one that influenced my work and led to my title, and it's by Catherine McKenzie, and it's specifically on women's rights, as I indicated at the start of the chapter. In fact, my recent work is stimulated by this early framing. 
um, of women's rights discourse, which I think got elided by singular race-based movements of the 20th century, as also by feminist movement. And I, I'm, what I was trying to do in my work is sort of move away from the debate about whether one should be a feminist or not. Feminism is an ideology but look at the question of women's rights and what are those rights from whatever position you take, right? Whether it's a conservative, hopefully not, but other kinds of activist positions which then can look at women's rights without the baggage of arguing over the ideological position. But for me, not abandoning it, but just saying that that's an ideological position that one could choose to have or not. So given all of the work then that the, wife, the Gavi wives did to advance his positions, we know that Gaviism, as I have argued, in Pan-Africanism, transnational Black feminism, and the limits of cultural discourse in African gender discourses, sorry, um, has a really major impact on how we see these things. Uh, furthermore, new work is beginning to come forward with that information. So essentially, if I can get to slide 27, we have then a number of other women like Claudia Jones who are involved in all kinds of other work bring together those that and again, as we said earlier, uh, so Claudia is in the Communist Party, but she is influenced by Amy Ashwood Gavi and the work of the International Federation of Women. She does work with Fumile Ransom Kuti, the, the mother of um, the, the mother of the, the fella Ransom Kuti, uh, who was also an activist and a whole heap of other positions, but she doesn't do them at the same time it seems to me they're sequential in different kinds of ways. And I say sequential because her major emphasis in the earlier days had to do with Black women's rights within the Communist Party USA and advancing those. But by the time she goes to London after exile, as you can see in that slide, um, where she uh, have identified her in that half the world formation, she's bringing together communism and Pan-Africanism and women's rights. And these three political ideological streams would be places where she would position herself. So this, you can see, this is the giant bust of Marx and many people I know tend to go there and see, um, pay respects to Marx and so on, put flowers as you can see. Um, but the Claudia Jones stone is to the left of Marx as you stand facing the Marx bust. Uh, I was there recently, it's been redone a bit by the Chinese government, but we want to do something right here where I'm seat, um, stooped looking at her work. But I'm suggesting that she's also doing um, um, a certain kind of activist work by that. I know we're running out of time, so let me move forward rapidly to conclusion then, if you don't mind. Uh, Una Marson is somebody also very significant because before Claudia, she's the one who advances Caribbean voices. She's a secretary to Haile Selassie when he goes to the League of Nations. She writes poetry and so on from Jamaica, she is doing that kind of activist work in London at that time. Um, the next slide, please. And I'm, I'm gonna just move through them and wrap the conversation up. So basically she, um, according to the people who've studied her well, she was one who also brought together that understanding of the simultaneity of oppressions, um, bringing together anti-colonial politics with feminism and activism that have to do with racial, uh, hierarchies and the importance of self-determination, that's your democracy, right? So essentially then we have all of these actions moving forward with these women. Uh, one could look then at several other women, um, including probably Queen Mother Moore, who uh, with Fanny Lou Hamer and others had a critical role in the civil rights period. But I wanna tie this into Kwame Turi because we need to um, be really clear about this. Um, that there, for, first of all, I want to say that there should be more work done in the Caribbean, and hopefully there will be places like Trinidad, Guyana, Grenada, and so on, where women were critical to mobilizing for independence, helping political parties take shape. But soon after the movement succeeded, male leadership kind of took over. Uh, and this is really obviously in, done in, as you can see, in the Caribbean, because I remember when I was a child, my mother, my aunt were very much involved in those women's movements, but when leadership happened, it was very male dominated. But there's a recent nice link with our dear Kwame Ture, who talks about the stellar leadership role of Fanny Lou Hamer. And it's a, it occurs in a book by Keisha Blaine, uh, which provides another example of women's leadership. 
and for Kwame Ture, she didn't just, um, she was not just a person who acted, and this is in his book, Ready for Revolution, which I saw Asha has on her shelf and which I also have. Uh, but but uh, Kwame Ture talks about the leadership and the friendship he had between Fanny Bluhema, uh, developed a kind of comradeship in which he actually had her visiting Guinea in 1964, um, which allowed her to see the African continuities with, with um, Mississippi community that she came from. But he says about her, she did not merely represent an idea. Um, she was smart and really funny, unlettered though she was politically, she had a shrewd understanding of political and economic power and the injustices of its effect on poor folk. More than a symbol, she was a day-to-day -day real leader in her community and as real to us as a member of the family and so on. And this is um, Asha on pages 350 to 316, where he talks about Fanny Lou Hamer. And I don't have time to really go into some of her work, but it's really important to know about her existence and the kind of impact she had on Kwame Turi. So we can conclude then, and this is conclusion, that the activist work by Black women for women's rights has existed from the suffragists in the early 20th century to the more recent Black Lives Matter movements. Women have been consistently involved in political party organizing and pan-African political struggle. Some have sought national office with seemingly more opportunities and left-leaning organizations and mainstream parties. And I say this because the women would run for, for leadership roles in the Communist Party before Shirley Chisholm, and I have some of that discussion in my work. Um, if you can go to slide 31 then, which is my work on Black women's rights, leadership, and the circularities of power, we could demonstrate then that a few factors contribute to this blatant underrepresentation. So some of the topics, slide 32, that I have, uh, you can see uh, identified there. But what we find then in the terms of the subject of women's rights, which I talked about earlier from the essay by Catherine McKenzie and Veronica Gregg's book, uh, is that women's rights or the rights of women has been consistently part of the framework of Black political activism and Pan-African struggle from the very origins. And from slide 34, once women are in leadership, according to the research we have, they tend to work towards reconciliation, restoring friendship and harmony in peace building contexts as Sulif and Gibori does, reintegration, protection of women during and after conflict, subsidiarity, finding governance at the lowest level and sustainability. So for me then in closing, still there's a need to advance beyond W.D. Boyce's early positions, right? Uh, and that's the, should be the one of the last slides up slide um, that talks about Du Bois. So W.B. Du Bois, as I said at the start, called the 20th century the century of the color line, right? Um, and this is interesting because, as I said earlier, he frames it as, um, the next one, please, if you don't mind. Next slide. Yeah, so Du Bois called the 20th century the century of the color line. This is, as I said earlier in his legendary call at the first Pan-African conference, and it's an off-repeated definition. But to me then, this allowed the 20th century to be marked as really circulating around the question of race, the color line, that is. What we should be saying, I am arguing in my work, is that we can also claim the 21st century, which we are in, as a century of Black women's leadership. And I posit, therefore, that the 21st century, even though it doesn't look like it now, we are still in the very early days, is one which will advance the role of women in creating a transformed and equitable world. If we can go to the next slide, according to Marielle Franco from Brazil, we should be about building structures to help empower poor black women to take on the role of active citizenship aimed at winning a city of rights. And that this is fundamental for the revolution the contemporary world requires. Thank you so much. This is a pleasure talking to you and your um, listening to me this afternoon, all the way in the United States. Trinidad and Tobago. <clears throat> wow. wow. Well, we've certainly been taken on a journey to understand the full feel and appreciation of women in the Pan-African struggle. I, I couldn't have found uh, someone, any other, um, what did they call um, our good um, lady, uh, who took people 
the Moses who took them out of slavery into the promised land. Um, certainly you've, you've taken us on an uh, interesting and rich journey, Carol, and we deeply appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. And I hope you're able to stay on so that when uh, we open the floor for questions, um, I hope a lot of our young listeners are there and, and thinking through what they've heard and to shape their questions so that we can have a rich and interesting um, discussion. To take us from the very senior uh, Professor Carol Boyce Davies to one of our young um, lecturers uh, at university now, and that is Dr. Keisha Thompson. Um, Keisha is an associate professor of psychology and the co-creator and co-director historically underrepresented faculty and staff resource center at CUNY and the doctorate in counseling psychology from Texas A&M University. She happens to be a native of Trinidad. We're happy and proud to hear that and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And she's completed her bachelor's degree in business education at Burke College CUNY and her master's in school counseling at Hunter College. She produced a very interesting film called There All Along, The Women of and Tobago 1970 Black Power. And it's her first film project. And she's also hosts a number of podcasts, Misadventures of an Inspired Woman and Black and Sick. So we are really pleased to have this young, uh, vibrant woman with us today, Dr. Keisha V. Thompson. So Dr. Thompson, the floor over to you. Tell us a little bit about your, your film project, how you, how you got involved and in and what you found out. There was uh, the feeling that we were not getting uh, our worth as an independent country. During that time, what I was hearing and what I was seeing happening, it gave me hope that that exponential opportunity was there for me, like everybody else. African people's clothes were not regarded as costumes. A natural hair and skin had its own beauty. There were cataclysmic results, shifts in the consciousness of people. It forced people to see different ways of looking at things, to critique European civilizations, to acknowledge everyday racism. Women have, have held their own in every aspect of the revolution. Women did the same work in every area of the struggle, but the men were very much in charge. State of emergency was a horrific time for women in Trinidad and Tobago. Women were raped by people like the police and it just went swept under the rug. The police could knock on your door at any time and you could be called off somewhere. You don't stop a movement. What we did in 1970, we raised the consciousness of people. You don't have to sugarcoat it. You don't have to over glorify it. But you must know what happened. 1970 almost brought down the government. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am here in Brooklyn. And as said, I was born and partially raised in Trinidad. I'm from Movat. Um, so in early on in my studies, I, I started thinking about this whole idea of Black racial identity as a psychologist. It's something that I was taught. It was something that I examined in therapy with others. Um, and so it oftentimes was spoken to from a Black American standpoint. And so being Trinidadian born, also having colleagues that might have been born um, across the diaspora that are Black in the United States, it meant different things to us. And a big part of what it meant to us was based on what our history. And so I started digging into the history. And interestingly enough, before I got there, um, I believe, um, Professor um, Boyce Davies mentioned um, Julia Coop, Anna Julia Cooper's quote of when and where I enter. And that was one of the main texts that I read by Paula Giddings, where she examined 
the role and the experiences of Black women in a lot of the um, social movements in the United States, starting from suffrage through um, civil rights and so forth. And it was interesting um, as she discussed before intersectionality became sort of like the popular term, what Black women were faced with in being a part of a movement that was based on them being Black, but their um, gender still very much playing a role in terms of how they were treated in the organizations as well as what role they took within the organizations. And so in about 2016, I started interviewing different individuals who might have been involved in Black Power in Trinidad. And the, the big thing about Black Power in Trinidad is that like it's not taught in schools. It's not in the history books. It's not something that um, is common knowledge. Oftentimes when I ask people questions, they either don't know or they get very silent. Um, and, and a big part of that silence has to do with the trauma and what people really experienced during those years. And so in doing those interviews, they were very male heavy. What we do know about Black Power is um, a lot of the male leaders that you would see um, in a lot of the photos or even anytime anything is mentioned, you hear about the male leaders. And in one of my interviews with one of the male leaders, um, Mr. Ome, he made a statement to me that stuck with me for a really long time. Um, in that interview with uh, Mr. Ome, um, Ayagoro Ome, he mentioned his mother um, and he was a young student at UE at the time. And then he said something in terms of the woman really saved us was the term that he said. And he was talking about that in the context of, there came a time where there was the state of emergency in Trinidad where the leaders were all rounded up and detained. But the organization of Anjak and all the different people who came together during that revolutionary period, the organization still ran, the organization still was able to do what needed to be done. And the reason that was, was because the women were not detained, mostly, I believe there might've been one woman who was detained. Um, they were still able to go out into the communities to um, be able to talk to people, to hand out literature, to do all the different things so that when the men came out of um, detention, they took up without skipping a beat. And so my film is called There All Along because my whole thesis of the film is that it's no way that you were just a woman in this organization one day and then the next morning you know all the things that need to be done. There's no way that happens. Um, the reason why the organization was able to move forward and the women you know, were able to do a lot of their work while being under heavy surveillance as well. So they not only had to do the work, but they had to be very smart about how they were doing the work. And so um, you don't just wake up one morning and know how to do this. It had to be that you were there all along in the leadership, in the decision making, in the rooms, knowing what was going on and knowing what you needed to do to keep things going. And so that's where the title of the film comes from. Um, one of my recent um, publications is called Loving with Their Consciousness, Black Women in Trinidad and Tobago, Black Power. And it's a piece in Women's Studies Quarterly. And the, the whole premise of this piece is that the exclusion of Black women's contributions to social movements has left a gap in the narrative in terms of revolutionary action, in terms of social movements. And so if you look at anything um, starting back from the Garvey movement, as um, Dr. Boyce Davies mentioned, uh, with both of his wives being heavily involved. And what's really interesting when you see that narrative and when you see the narrative of um, Trinidad Black Power is you hear that women become involved when the men are taken away. You hear that women are leading the organization when there's been some sort of disaster. And again, I would say, you don't just wake up one morning and know how to do these things. Really and truly, a lot of times, women are the ones who are the decision makers, who are 
maybe not necessarily the ones that's saying the final decisions publicly, but they definitely are influencing them. Throughout the documentary, one thing that both men and women said was that the women did every job that the men did. There was, there was no such thing as this was men's work and this was women's work, right? And that's not to say that there wasn't friction or there wasn't um, difficulties, right? Because the nature of patriarchy is that it's very, um, is very invasive. It doesn't just go away. And so if you have a microcosm of society within an organization or a movement, there's no way that patriarchy isn't in there kicking up dust, right? And so there certainly were those struggles. And so in, in the documentary, um, um, Intu tells a very interesting story of um, someone trying to dictate to her who she should be in relationship with. You know, and she she very much says like this is my body, and you cannot govern my body, right? And and some of the men that are in the documentary will also say, you know, some of the brothers had a hard time. Um, one of the things that uh, um, Elaine Brown, who was the chairperson of the Black Panthers for a period of time, in that documentary, she makes a statement and she says that you know it's not like these brothers came from revolutionary heaven, right? So there still were challenges within the, the organization and the movement with the male female dynamic, not just in terms of romantic love per se, but in terms of who was gonna take what roles. What's really remarkable about the 1970 um, revolution and that movement is that there is very intentional action and language about brothers and sisters being equal and brothers and sisters loving each other. And really a lot of the work that um, would have been done would be around how do you respect your sister? How do you respect your brother, right? And so in gathering this information, for me being a black woman that lives in the United States and then being a black girl from Trinidad and Tobago, it really was a very, a very, um, sort of spiritual experience for me to literally sit at the feet of my elders, um, like into like Olavisi, who will speak next, um, like Mr. Ome, um, like Fuseli, and just hear from them what their experience were, experiences were um, and how they really stood up in situations where they didn't have to. They stood up for people at times that they didn't have to. Um, they chose to put themselves in that position. And so in my piece, is that, that special edition is all about Black love as revolution. And so in my piece, I talk about um, using Bell Hook's term, all the great movements for social justice in our society have strongly emphasized a love ethic. And so it's a very interesting thing to have experienced as well as um, a big part of what the women were able to do carries over into who they are today in society. Like you'll hear from Dr. Olabisi in a little bit and she has been an educator her whole life, right? And she, she chose to, to actively participate in that movement and it wasn't without sacrifice. It wasn't without her um, having to give up certain things or having to, to have certain um, frictions within her life. Um, but she was able to, from that movement, move forward into her life where she educate, she's educated so many people and continues to do so. You don't sit in the presence of these women without learning something. You don't sit in their presence without being inspired and to really think about what am I doing and what should I be doing? And so within the movement in Trinidad and Tobago, um, some people will even point to the movement pushing forward um, some, somewhat of the feminist movement within the greater Caribbean as well, because of the role that a lot of these women, these are the same women who um, were able to take up these positions and take up these roles and move forward into society and make a big impact. When you look at a woman like Intu, like she continues to educate, not just the people who she works with in terms of teaching them about the creative arts, but she's 
every, you know, every time she does something, she's educating the public as a whole as well. And so um, the things that I found most remarkable was that women were placed in the same type of danger as men. Women were given, were, were sometimes not given the same opportunities to lead, but when, you know, when the time came, when that detention came, they were able to step up um, and just step into those roles seamlessly. Um, I think I'll give, I'll lend the rest of my time here um, until I know all of BC has some tie-ins with education here, um, but happy to answer any questions that people may have about the film and about some more specific instances. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Keisha. That is a lovely, uh, really has a lovely rich present. I am particularly, um, I, I'm particularly impressed with you uh, coming with the notion of the love ethic, you know, of the movement and, and once over time. Um, I think that's very important. I mean, I think it was Malcolm behind me there. We, you do this out of the love of your people. So that, that, that was a, a very interesting. Um, a very interesting uh, finding there in your work. And now, yes, we are going to turn to our good sister, Dr. Olubisi Kuboni. And um, I, I really like the way Kisha did my job for me by introducing um, my sister. Dr. Kuboni has been in the movement for social and polit political change in Trinidad and for several decades. In the 1970s and 80s, she held various leadership positions in the National Joint Action Committee, including head of the women's arm. She also played a leading role in the production of many of NJAC's publications, most notably its National News Deliberation, then EDMAC Speaks, which was the organ of the National Women's Action Committee. Additionally, Ola B.C. was involved in NJAC's community thrust, building grassroots organizations to address the socioeconomic conditions impacting people's lives. Um, see in her notes that um, uh, Olabisi actually was our, like our lead tutor, our, our lead tutor when we organized um, auxiliary schools for children, when we felt the need that, that our children just weren't being provided of education in the school system, we decided, okay, a Saturday school and a holiday school would have to play its, its part in strengthening the knowledge base of our children about who they are and how to respond to the world around them. And Ola guided us in that process in setting up school. And the children who've been through that school, that little school that we had through the, through the AME church, um, they've all done very well, both um, in, in terms of their academic performance, but also in terms of being human beings. Um, Ola joined the Constitution uh, forum of Trinidad and Tobago in 2003 and subsequently held the position of chair for five years. A key feature of the work of the CRF over the extended period was the part of the People's Manifesto for Constitutional Reform, first in 2007 and then updated in 2013. Dr. Kuboni is a retired senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies, having served some 20 years as an institution in teacher development and open online distance learning. In her retirement, she work in online learning and as a social activist. I love what um, uh, Mr. Carroll talked about, that group um, of over 50 women. Well, myself, BC, could well join them in, um, in, a, in, in struggling to continue um, that, that notion of, uh, of continued struggle um, for social justice. View Dr. Olubisi Kuboni. No, we're not hearing you, so you may be muted. Ah, we can't hear you still. Can you check that? Um... No, now you're moved. Okay, let's, let's see. 
Sing again, please, Ola. No, we cannot hear you. No, we cannot hear you. Do you want to come and come back in? Yes. Okay. So Dr. Olabisi is going to come out of the program and re-enter and see if that uh, provides her with the, the correct um, the correct uh, technological issues that we need to have resolved. And while she's doing that, uh, may I ask um, of, of our good sister, Dr. Carol Boyce Davies, uh, Carol, we've already received a question for, for you. So I'm just preparing you in advance. Um, someone, one of our young participants um, wants to know if you're going to help by supplying them with, um, with a, a reading list and, and the list of the, the, some of the material that you shared in your, um, in your presentation. Ola, are, we, are you back in with All us? Right. Are one, you hearing okay. me? Yes, I give you Dr. Olubisi okay. Kubori. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that small break. Um, it was good hearing both um, Sister Carol and Sister Keisha talk about um, women as leaders. And uh, in particular, I was, I was really taken with Sister Carol talking about the grassroots organizations that were formed and um, within organizations. And in particular, the work of um, Sister Amy Ashford Gavi and uh, Sister Amy Jack Gavi, and uh, the specific kinds of projects that they got involved in, in terms of building uh, um, around certain areas within the Gavi movement. Um, I like to think of the National Women's Action Committee in, uh, in NJAC as a, a group of women. Um, we did a lot of things, but a group of women who were able to come together, even though we were part of the wider organization, but we came together to focus on specific things that um, we felt impacted the lives of women and from our base within the organization launched out to women in the wider communities to work with them, dialogue with them around issues that were of importance to all of us as women. So we looked at the issues such as, um, you know, house, housing crisis, um, uh, women who were deemed to be squatters, for example, and uh, were told by the authorities that they had no right to build houses in the places that they were building in, even though none was being provided by the state. So we looked at the whole thing of housing crisis, looked at things like um, uh, stood up with women uh, to fight for basic um, things like water and so on. And one of the areas that we spent a lot of our attention on, paid a lot of attention to, was the, the, the issue of the education of the children. And uh, so we would work with women to look at uh, some of the basic issues like um, poor infrastructural conditions in, in schools around the country and uh, to raise our voices and to make our voices heard to the authorities to address these issues because uh, um, there was need to have them see their responsibility, the authorities that is, to provide better conditions for our children in schools. So I want to take up from that this evening um, and look specifically at uh, education not back then but um i want to 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 pivot to looking at education in our society of trinidad and tobago now and uh, to see what kinds of um 
ways in which we could, uh, um, from a woman's point of view, um, uh, try to build awareness and build consciousness to improve the quality, to, to make a, a statement about improving the quality of education for children in, in our country. And uh, so I am moving away somewhat from thinking, looking particularly at uh, women in terms of the building of women's organizations or the work of women or women in a patriarchal um, situation, but looking at a specific um, issues, the issue of education, the quality of education that women could be involved in in Trinidad and Tobago to make the point about improving and enhancing the quality of education for our children. So this presentation is largely going to be about education or to use a phrase that we used back in the 1970s and 80s in NWAC on the move for proper education. And I'm going to look at it from two points of view, the two, um, the two sets of education that we have, primary education and the secondary education. Now, before I get into those two areas, there's a big thing going on now, and I suppose in other um, countries as well, in the post-COVID period, um, uh, to talk about uh, how children have been underachieving. There's all the talk about loss of learning and, and that kind of thing. So underachievement is a big buzzword in Trinidad and Tobago now. And going along with that, um, our Ministry of Education is talking about the need for remediation. In fact, those of us who live here know that the ministry is uh, on a whole scale drive for um, providing remediation to, um, to address the issue of what is called, what it is choosing to call underachievement. Now, I want to look at those two words, first of all, particularly in relation to, to African people and to African youth. Um, one of the things that is very common in, in, in Trinidad, and I don't know why it is happening this way, but, well, I think I have an idea why, but wouldn't go into that now, is that African children are failing, and there is a lot of talk around that, that African children are failing, um, our children are at the bottom of the pile, and almost all of um, underachievement in the society is linked to um, African children. So right at the outset, I want to disassociate myself from that kind of talk. I want to um, not only just disassociate myself, but to object strongly to, to that kind of talk because uh, our children are doing uh, very well. There are groups of our children who are doing very well, thousands of them who are doing very well and uh, making both themselves proud and their families and their communities proud. At the same time, I cannot be naive, you know, not to recognize as well that in certain communities in the society, um, particularly in certain urban areas and in certain rural areas, because of certain socioeconomic factors and so on, there is a, a significant amount of underachievement and uh, that has to be dealt with and that we must face up to. But I still want to maintain the fact that talk of uh, African children at the bottom of the pile is a lot of foolishness. Um, then there's a the question of remediation, as I said, the ministry is very much into organizing programs for remedial education. In fact, right now, during the long vacation, school is just out. They are um, organizing remedial programs for both primary school students and secondary school students 
whom they deem needed to spend five weeks of their long vacation um, and not doing things what normal children do during the long vacation, but to go to school, um, which I, I think is problematic for me. Um, but besides being problematic that the, 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 the school holidays is being taken up to um, uh, deal with remediation and school work nine to four or nine to three or something like that, um, or when they should be doing other things or engage in other kinds of activities. I have a problem with the notion of remediation. I have a problem with the notion that you just uh, come in uh, and in short bursts and you try to remediate what they did not know. Um, that I think is counterproductive and I have uh, a problem with a vast wholesale um, thrust that the Ministry of Education is on to now of dealing with all these uh, remedial programs. Because in my mind, and I am pretty sure about that, it is just going to have these uh, children stay in the same place because no amount of pick up here and pick up there and ad hoc snapshot kind of thing is really going to deal with uh, enhancing the quality of education um, for our children. So I want to go to, to primary education. I heard Carol say she got licks in school. Um, I smiled when I, when I heard that. Um, that is not allowed these days, Carol. So you could rest assured it is, it is not as bad as when you were in Eastern girls. Um, no, but there are some serious things about primary education here, which I feel that because uh, um, uh, our Ministry of Education is so taken up in doing remediation and uh, solving the problems of underachievement, there are some structural issues that are going to keep our children back. Um, in particular, I am thinking of African children in these uh, vulnerable communities that I think should be brought to the fore. First of all, there is the issue of um, there, there, there is the issue of uh, criteria that is in place. Uh, that uh, children supposed to meet to enter primary school. What some of my retired primary school teachers have been telling me within recent times is that uh, um, primary school for children entering, um, they are no longer taught reading. It is expected that they would enter the school having uh, some amount of reading skills that they are bringing into the, the, the school system. So we have a situation where not all children, in particular children who are in vulnerable situations, would have had the opportunity to be in an environment where they are taught reading skills, where they are taught writing, and, and language skills and so on. They are not in that environment, but at five years old, they go into to primary school and the expectation is that they are coming with uh, those skills already being taught. So you could see a problem there as well. What is happening in, in, in Trinidad, and I don't know if it is happening in other places, is that the ministry is paying a lot of attention to early childhood care and education. Um, uh, Sister Asha talked about what we used to do um, uh, with our Saturday school. And I, I see it as very much in line with what we were doing in our Saturday school, looking at the holistic development of the child. Now, I don't have any problem with early childhood care and education as such, because I am a firm believer that one must create environments that look at the holistic um, development of the child 
um, in terms of emotional development, physical development, cognitive development, and so on. The issue, though, is, and, and government is very much in, in, involved in uh, putting up these kinds of schools all over the country. However, the problem is that while government is paying attention to setting up ECC centers, and as I said, I am very much in favor of that, those centers do not prepare the children for formal education in primary school. So therefore, if you are coming out of the ECC situation, you are not necessarily going to be prepared to enter primary school. Primary school does not um, pay attention to these uh, um, basic skills anymore. So what you have are certain kind of children, certain children in vulnerable communities, African children who would be lost when they enter primary school. Now, as they go into primary school, we go to um, the see that we are we are operating on two separate tracks one who one track of students who would have come from a pre-primary situations where they were taught all these um skills and so are very much in line moving towards um c secondary entrance examination and another um, set of children who probably went to um, an ECC center, but are not on the same track. So we have uh, um, uh, a differentiation between these two sets of children. Before I get off, you know, talking about primary school, what I think is happening is that, um, and I'm just going to jump to this, what is happening is that uh, children, um, the school system, the primary school system is a very much taken up with preparing children to sit the 11 plus exam initial secondary entrance assessment. And so my feeling is that as uh, children are not being taught the basics at the beginning, most of the, the, the primary school is taken up with Pre exam preparation leading up to the C exam. Some make it, especially if you had the grounding from pre-primary years, some do not make it. And so there is a, a relatively high failure rate uh, for some children, whereas there is a, a very high pass rate for others. So that is the status of our second or primary education. Let me just go quickly to um, secondary. Because we have that primary situation, primary um, school situation, we have a, a distinction between poor students and very good students at the secondary level. Um, in fact, wouldn't go into this now, but we have a secondary schools that are, in a sense, elite secondary schools that cater for those who come very high in the secondary entrance examination. And there are others that are not um, have that same level and are struggling schools. These schools came about um, the expansion. We have to go to the fact that back in the 1960s, um, there was a first to expand the secondary education. The prime minister at that time, Dr. Eric Williams, was very keen, we're moving into independence, to build um, an educated population, build an educated population, not only in the sense of bringing more young children into secondary school prior to that, 
primary school was the, the cutoff point for a lot of people, um, in particular people in vulnerable uh, working class, um, you know, um, families. So the intention was to open it up and build, make more children come into secondary education, not only to bring more people into secondary education, but also to um, expand the curriculum um, away from the conventional areas of study that we had gotten used to under colonial rule. So the big thing of about um, Dr. Eric Williams and the government in the in the coming into independence was to expand the curriculum and in particular to introduce technical and vocational education and training into the school curriculum. Without um, trying to, to get you know, any further into that, that has not worked out well for us. And so the, the conventional um, education from colonial times more or less remained the pinnacle of what was uh, aspired to. And uh, TVET, Technical and Vocational Educational Training, fell by the wayside. So as I'm going to wrap up now, I want to make two recommendations in terms of uh, um, secondary education. I think it is important to take note of that vast amount of uh, children from uh, vulnerable communities, in particular those urban communities where we have uh, African people who are the ones um, in going to the schools that are not really achieving well. I am, think, I am saying that we, we needed to reorient those schools and uh, create uh, um, specialist schools where we pay attention to the creating specialist um, types of instructional programs geared towards not hurricane up remediation, but a whole five year program, five, six year program, where you have um, specially designed instructions um, to cater for people who are not achieving well. And that takes them through five years. Next, I'm saying that some of the schools should be converted into full TVET schools um, in which emphasis is placed on building um, the curriculum in all the areas of technical and vocational education and training so that a wider um, curriculum is uh, available and accessible, not just for poor children, for everybody, but um, that is available and is properly taught and is properly handled, not thrown in the corner for the, for the poor ones who can't make it into so-called academic studies but it is properly handled. And so we have uh, um, a full stream of technical and vocational education and training for all children, including these um, who may not be um, who coming from vulnerable, vulnerable um, situations. So I'll stop there for now, but this is um, a kind of a, overview of what I think um, a woman's movement of the 21st century can uh, um, take up um, because there is a desperate need to improve and enhance the quality of education for all our children. Thank you. And I see Asha waiting on me.
You are muted, Miss Asha. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I've been muted all the time and no one told me that. Forgive me, forgive me. I was just saying that we just experienced the passion of Sister Olabisi and an issue that she has worked on for many years of her life. And we are in a very critical situation in Trinidad and Tobago now where the education of our children is concerned. Fortunately, unfortunately, even though African children are not all at the bottom as she and rightfully says, it is us who are falling off the table in this in a chaotic moment when um, uh, the government is trying some of it to engage mediation and other activities. But so I really thank you, and I I, I thank you all for for the bliss of taking your time away from discussing, in a sense, just what for, but to share with us what it, what that activism looks like in real life. Having said that, I'm going to open the floor for questions, and there were some burning questions. Somebody asked, and let me start, go back to my good sister, Carol, because Carol, someone was asked about your, your, your commentary on the um, Amy Garvey and, and that, that discussion around Dubois and advising him that it's an idea to continue using Negro, but to use the, the term Pan-Africanism. And can you just tell us a little bit more about that? And and I think the person is also saying if you could refer them to something you could read or look at for that information. Yes, of course. Um, I take it I'm here. You all can hear me. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, you. it's actually in a, well, first of all, I, I need, no, I, I'm so impressed with the work of Keisha Thompson. And I'm so glad to know about you, my sister. What a joy. And that was what I was saying that we need more work that look at looks at the various movements in the Caribbean, uh, Trinidad for sure. And I'm glad you interviewed I too and uh, Ulubisi and several other women. So keep going and congrats on your work. And I'm maybe I hope I can get to see the film where if you can share it or something later, I'll be really looking forward to that. I just wanted to big you up on that and, and the way you use bell hooks and also your way you slid, slid in the patriarchy in your discussion very nicely without i think my generation will be like what i guess but you were like oh the patriarchy is always there kicking up the <laughs> so anyway but um yeah somebody had asked earlier about um uh, bibliography for sure but the piece i mentioned i was really happy to go back to that in doing my book uh, is Amy Jakes Garvey, and it's in a book uh, edited by Veronica Gregg, which you don't really see much anymore, but you can probably find it in a library, and it's about the writings of Caribbean women from 1890. Uh, so that was what, was what blew my mind and gave me the, the courage to really use women's rights, because I saw it as a frame that women were using um, that kind of got lost in our, you know, discussions around who is a feminist, who is not, and so on. And I just wanted to go back to grab that again, because the question of rights to me are so fundamental and they link to all of the international protocols. I, the thing is, we don't realize as black women that we have these rights that are enshrined. So we should actually have 50% representation in most parliaments, in most governments, in most organizations. And I remember once I raised that, I was president of the, um, Women's Caucus of the African Literature Association. And I raised it because the caucus had decided that we wanted 50% leadership and I was the president. So they asked me to bring it up at the general body. Oh my God, the men were shut, shutting us down on that. They were fixed. How dare you all want that and all that. Uh, and now I realize it's something that women have been asking for all along, that, that representation, having 6% in 2000, that really blew my mind too. That that was that was a thing. Six percent. So yes. we should be happy when we get one person at the Supreme Court. That's really what they're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And if that mm -hmm. one person is there, like Katanji trying to represent, she you know has to really be battling against all this drama. And those of you who are in organizations know very well that when you're the only one in one of these groups, mm -hmm. they don't really listen, and you're always having to fight back and push back to get your voice heard and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So basically. It's not a big jump to say that we should have full representation and Trinidad should move with the rest of the world and in, in leadership and government and 
move beyond the 28 or 30 percent that they have to really go for 30 percent because this is where back to all point you get women talking about issues that relate to children's welfare and well-being that's one of the primary ones the women mm -hmm. who do that um, discussion in africa that's what they say when you talk to them they say they want their children to be able to get a good meal and go to school and and live well that's what they want uh, they, they want to be raped, they don't want to be beaten, they want to be able to get an education and live a decent life. They also want to have ways that they share in the wealth of their country so that they're not begging for small handouts so that, you know, they get every time you get some benefit, it's seen as like a big deal. But it should be part and parcel of the government framework where you are given an equal share of the country's resources. It's not socialism. It's not any of those other frameworks in which they put it. It's a question of equitable distribution of resources that even market women who you talk to on the street ask for. Their children to do well, they to have a share, they to be able to decide what happens with their country, to avoid all these violent situations that women are put in, wars and beaten up on the streets, beaten up by their men or what have you. So basically all of that. On the question Negro, that's where you will find um, surely um, Amy Jake Scabby's discussion about uh, the use of the word Negro that you should not use it. He actually, she actually has a piece in that same Veronica Gregg's uh, collection on that. But the point, the, the essay I mentioned is really hard to find, but you can actually find it online by Richard Moore. The word Negro is origin and evil, evil use, where he actually lays out the ways in which that word Negro was created to, to represent um, the diminution of the humanity of the black subject during enslavement on the continent, even before they got to Africa, be sorry, to the Americas. So even before that we got to the Americas, they were already creating these definitions that reduced our humanity to a piece, uh, a piece as, as Winter would call it, but also um, an equivalent to the word Negro, Negro, whatever, all of it is negative. It was removing the ethnic identities and giving you an identity as a Negro, which meant a person to be exploited. However, they pejoratively determined it, whether the N-word or what have you, they all related to that same framework of taking away our humanity, our ethnic identity, or our full humanity, and giving us these horrible representations. And well, let me see, I didn't really get beaten in school. I, I was saying that I was fear of it always. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to because time is so short now. I'm going to ask um, if we get a little raw discussion so people can just give us their last thoughts. If there's anything else they wanted to add that they've done, so Keisha, I'm going to start with you and then I'll move to um. Ola BC, and then Carol Boyce Davies. So thank you, um, Dr. Boyce Davies. I am a fan. I've read your words, um, and I'm a fan. So thank you, um, just in awe of being in your presence today. Um, and so I think, I think for me, where this work started for me was I, I started asking questions about how we as Caribbean people in the U.S. were interacting with with what was happening to Black Americans, at least with me coming up. I was always told I was different, I was, you know, you're not like that. And, and there is that difference. But I thought that the generations before with Harry Belafonte and um, Kwame Ture, like they got involved with the causes of Black Americans. And so I was trying to figure out a lot of that stuff. Um, and so this is what brought me to a lot of this work is looking at you know, how connected we actually are in our struggles across the diaspora and how much commonalities we have as women in whatever struggle we are within whatever context. And that really recognizing the humanity in each other is what allows us to mobilize and really um, take that revolutionary action. Oh. Thank you very much, Keisha. Good, 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 good message to send us off on. Ola, do you have anything? Uh, I mean, you just laid it on us, but you may just have one other point you want to hit us. I suspect something else you want to say. We give you the floor, Ola. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. Oh, it's just like cussing. 
Ah, a história. <laughs> oh, no, no. It seems like we've lost all of BC with that their, her system. Okay, so Carol, the, 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 the closing point, the point is... Well, I think I've said so much. You know, I tend to pack whatever I, every presentation I have with a lot of material. <laughs> Sometimes it's too yes. much. So I'm hoping maybe people have a chance to go back and listen to some of the details. And in fact, towards the end, I realized the time was going and I left out a lot of things because I'm like, I can't take up all the time. So, <laughs> but I, I want to say it. thank you for doing this. It's a good, um, you can see this topic can go on for another hour. Clearly. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I hope clearly. we do, and I think maybe I would recommend, I'd recommend humbly, that each year you do a version of this of yes. in Pan African struggle, and calling different absolutely. people to be part of that discussion. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to come to Trinidad this year. It's like, oh. No. Yeah, we're going to miss you. We're going to yeah. miss you. But we're I went to Ghana you. and I just came I, back yesterday. And <laughs> so that I'm is surprised I'm able to yeah. hold up so well. But, yes, we really thank you for this effort right. because we know that that was not going to be an easy journey not but let me thank all of us who've been with us for the last two hours i mean and all those questions we're sorry we can't answer them but it has really been a very rich and wonderful discussion i mean i every time i my other sisters i learn every time i hear my sisters i learn so i've learned from um carol i've learned from olabisi i've learned from keisha and i hope you have um in sharing this session with us you feel that as the night has gone you too have learned so we thank you for for the joining us for the last few weeks we've looked at issues of how africa sits its struggles and successes in the international we've looked at our own brother kwame we've looked at issues on haiti and now here we are off with women in the Pan-African struggle. Thank you once again, and thank you to everybody who's worked to make this a good evening.